एथिकल कंसिडरेशन शुरू से चालू है क्या वो नोट किया हुआ है So, Dr. Gulam Ali has a very beautifully told you there are three principles to treating low vision clients. The first is increasing illumination, the second is magnification, and producing a good, doing a good refraction and dispensing glasses. So, we'll play upon all three of these principles and help the low vision client. Before we actually go on to clinical dispensing, let me tell you a little bit about light, glare, and contrast, how to modify them to help the low vision patient. So this is the normal amount of illumination a person requires in order to see well. For reading, one requires 400 lux of illumination. For sewing, about 600 lux. And for classrooms, one needs about 300 lux of illumination. But a low vision patient, to break through the mistiness of his vision, will require high intensity diffuse illumination, which is about 1,000 lux per person. And how can we provide that to him? That can be done by either natural light or artificial lighting. For natural light source, one can sit near the window and illumination from a window is about 10,000 lux on a bright day and about 2,000 lux on a cloudy day. So that provides sufficient illumination to a low vision person in order to see. So far as artificial light is concerned, then one must remember that the best way to do it is an angle poised lamp or a gooseneck lamp, lamp because you can adjust the direction of illumination and the distance from the light source with these two types of lamps. The illumination from lamps is given by this formula where I stands for illumination in foot candles, CP is the luminous intensity of source, and B is the inverse of the distance from the source of illumination to the uh, area where the light is falling. So if you use this formula and fit into the wattage of the lamps you have, then you can get how much illumination you will require. So if you have a 100 watt lamp and you keep it one foot away from the object of regard, then you have a 1,000 lux of illumination on the book being read. If you change that to 200 watts and keep it at a one foot distance, that will give you 2,000 lux of illumination. And if you keep a 200 watt bulb at six inches distance, it will give you 8,000 lux of illumination. So this is how you play with the wattage of the bulb and the distance from the object of regard. Then there are certain considerations that you need to keep in mind when you're using artificial illumination sources. The first is consistency. The source should be consistent in producing the illumination. There should be no flickering as is present when you use a single fluorescent tube. So flickering produces a lot of fatigue in low vision clients. So you should have multiple tubes or use an incandescent bulb like this because this does not flicker and will give no fatigue to the patient. Then tungsten bulb usually has source deterioration, so does fluorescent lighting. So it must be cleaned and changed because a lot of dust accumulates on the surface of the lamps. So one must clean these sources of light frequently and change bulbs when the source deteriorates. <coughs> one must always use an incandescent bulb like this over a fluorescent tube like this. Why? Because of blue light emission and we'll consider it more in details in the next few slides. And the background illumination must be about 20 to 50% darker only, not more darker than that. Otherwise, that will produce a lot of fatigue by accommodation here and there and everywhere all the time when he shifts his gaze. Now, this is the emission spectrum of an incandescent bulb. Notice there's very little blue light over here. And the emission mostly is in the red and infrared range of the spectrum. But the eye is very insensitive to red and infrared, so most of the things that we see with an incandescent bulb is in the green and yellow range of the spectrum. That's why incandescent bulbs appear yellow to us. But the key thing is the blue light, which is minimal. Now take a look at CFL light sources. There is a peak of blue light over here from the mercury which is present in the lamps, and these are the colors from the phosphors, okay? Take a look at LED lamps here. There's an intense blue peak with LED lamps. And these are the colors from the phosphors. So both CFL and LED lamps produce an intense peaks in the blue light, which is short wavelength light. Blue light scatters too much in the environment and produces loss of contrast. So a low vision patient will not be able to function well in LED light sources and CFL light sources. So always insist on incandescent light sources for artificial illumination. 
Another thing to consider is glare, because glare is very incapacitating for normal patients also, normal people also, and more so for uh, low vision patients. So the best way to combat glare outdoors is to wear a hat with a brim or sunglasses or visors, and indoors is to use blinds and curtains on windows and tinted glasses on windows, and you can work with the back towards the window. So these are simple ways in which you can cut down glare for low vision patients. Then you can also use absorptive filters like these. Absorptive filters come in various shades, ranging from gray to amber, orange, yellow, and plum. I think my pointer has stopped working. No, it's working. So this one over here, which is gray in color, and this one over here, which is plum in color, they reduce the overall transmission of light. So they are ideal for cutting down glare, whereas these three ones in the middle, amber, orange, and yellow, also cut down blue light transmission, so they're ideal for contrast enhancement. So these are some of the properties of the various absorptive filters. You know the, the gray ones are polaroid in nature and the rest of them are made of polycarbonate. All of them block out ultraviolet A and B 100%. And gray, as I told you, is best for outdoor anti-glare protection and the other ones are good for <coughs> contrast enhancement. These two for general contrast enhancement and these two specifically for indoor enhancement of contrast. The disadvantage is with these four ones is that the blue color appears black when you wear them and the green color is not seen. So now we come to the four important steps of actually prescribing low vision aids in your clinical practice. The first step is recording vision. The second is to predict magnification. The third step is to select a device and dispense it. And the fourth is train the client in using the device. So a lot of testing kits are available in the market. The one we use in our clinic is Keeler 1H1 set and 1K1 set for near, but they are very expensive. We are not going to use these sets in a clinical setting for a novice practitioner or a beginner practitioner. We can use whatever material is available in our clinic, and I'll tell you how a little later. Screening vision or testing vision, recording vision for low vision patients is a daunting task. Because if you were to use the normal Snellen optotypes, then you would really have to have very huge optotypes to record the vision of low vision patients, which is impractical. The other thing to do is, is to use special charts for low vision and a smaller testing distance. We'll have a look at them, but we won't rely on them. We'll use the regular Snellen chart, and I'll tell you how later. So this is the Keeler distance vision ch chart, and these have got huge letter optotypes and meant for testing at a three meter distance. And this is the one for near vision testing. And you can see it has got a predictive value also. If this is what the patient reads, then you would require 12x of magnification. So it's a simple device, it gives you a rough idea of what uh, magnification a person would require. But we are not going to use all, these, uh, all this fancy stuff in our clinical practice. We don't really, though we have it. And this is the Bailey Lovi chart, which is a Logmar chart, which was specifically developed for uh, low vision clients and which was adapted by the EDTRS later on. And these are certain near vision charts also based on uh, logmar activity. But in our clinic, we will use the Stenel chart, the regular ordinary chart, and this is how we use it. We can use this chart to test the vision at smaller distances like 10 feet instead of 20 feet or five feet or even three feet, okay? Once you've recorded the vision at small distances, you can convert it to the regular testing distance of uh, 20 feet or six meters by multiplying with a suitable number. For instance, if you're testing at five feet and the patient can read the top line only, vision is five by 200, which is multiplied by four by four, comes out to 20 by 800 vision. So this is a very familiar fraction to us. Or if you're using the British notation and the vision at three meters, uh, if this is the vision three by 24, then you convert it to the regular notation by multiplying it by two by two, which comes to 648 vision, which is a familiar notation to us. So this is how you can use the regular chart in the clinic to measure the vision of a low vision patient. <coughs> so when you're actually prescribing distant low vision aids, what do you take care of? The first thing is to give him spectacle correction as Dr. Gulam Ali has already mentioned, because that will increase the sharpness of his retinal image. Then you must remember to avoid distant low vision aids if mobility is good. If the patient has 460 vision or 560 vision and he can navigate properly in the surrounding environment, walk in the streets, 
there's no sense in giving him a low vision aid. Prescribe low vision aids, which is, uh, which is of the lowest useful power. This is the other thing that you need to remember. And the rule of the thumb is, if the vision is more than 660, you right away give 2.5x magnification. If the vision is less than 660, you give 6x or 8x. Now, this is the rule of the thumb. The other way you can do it is to actually predict what magnification a person requires. And prediction of magnification is very easy. You have to set a target acuity first. For instance, the patient wants to see 6.6, six, that's all right. But if you don't know what target acuity there is, you can take 6.12, which is as a ballpark figure. And then the magnification required is given by this formula. Desired acuity divided by the current visual acuity. So if you want to improve the vision from 6.60, 6.6, the magnification required would be 6.6 divided by 6.60 which is 10x. So 10x is the magnification required. You can go one step up or one step down depending upon the patient's demand and visual comfort. You can predict near low vision aids also by what is known as the Kestenbaum's rule. And Kestenbaum said that if you want to give the patient J5 vision, then you take the recipro reciprocal of his distant visual acuity. So if it is 660, then you get 10 which is a 10 diopter sphere or 2.5x magnification. And this is good enough to read newsprint. If you want to give him J3 vision, then multiply the reciprocal vision by 1.4 and so on and so forth. But remember, you have to subtract the available accommodation, especially in young children and young adults by an arbitrary value of eight, six, five, three, and one diopter for age ranges from 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50 years. So you have to subtract from this value before you finally give him a prescription. And then we were made, when you made a prediction, you can go one level up and one level down while you're testing him, depending upon the patient's comfort and demands, and prescribe the final low vision aid. So these are the steps in prescribing near low vision aids. First, try spectacle magnifier. Because spectacle magnifiers, as Dr. Ali has told you, gives you the widest field possible the second thing is it's very familiar. It, it is not so obvious on your face, and people can't look at you and say, oh, you are wearing some kind of aid. So this is very good for patients also. The acceptability of spectacle magnifiers is great. The second choice would be hand magnifier. You can also com combine both of them together. A person using a spectacle magnifier can further improve his magnification by using a hand magnifier. Then. You give stand magnifiers only in cases of patients who've got tremors or arthritis or who have to do prolonged near tasks. Telemicroscopes are prescribed only if extended working distance is desired. And large print books are offered when text lesser than 18 point is not visible to the patient, even with high ads. And a CCTV when 18 point text is not visible with high ads. And you put the patient on braille when CCTV also fails to improve his vision. Training is very really essential. I won't dwell on large, at large on how you train patients with using low vision aids. But this is the cost of low vision devices in the Indian market. Spectacle magnifiers cost about 500 rupees. And distant telescopes, which are of course imported, would cost you anything, anywhere between 2,500 to 8,000 rupees. And these are the places where you can get low vision devices from. Baliwala and Homi. Homi produces a testing kit as well as, this, as, well as cells uh, distant telescopes, and you can source your low vision devices from Madhu, Akriti Octoplastic, Lenscell, and there are a host of other vendors who sell low vision devices in India. And these are the international brands which are also available in our country, Keeler, Coil, Eschenbach, and Occutech. But as, I, as probably somebody has mentioned or not mentioned, I do not know, yes, we, we, I did, I did, that this is a team effort, you know. <coughs> you have to work many times with other professionals like medical professionals, social workers, and special teachers and rehabilitationists, especially if it's a child who has got multiple handicaps and profound loss of vision. So basically, it's a team effort. Most of the time, you can dispense low vision aids in your clinic, but oftentimes, you'll have to work together with other rehabilitation specialists too. Now, environmental adaptation is very important for low vision patients, like tactile flooring, as you can see in this picture. If you go to China, Japan, America, even the sidewalks will have tactile flooring and guide low vision patients on where to walk. 
but unfortunately we don't have this kind of thing in our country. So when I was building a new wing in my hospital, I put up this contrast line in all the walls in my hospital. So if a low vision patient walks into my hospital, then he has a contrast line to guide him where to go. Now this is an ordinary looking office, but there's more than meets the eye because this office room has been totally adapted for a low vision worker. There's a large display clock over here, large print dictionary and thesaurus over here, large print software over here, and magnifier over here. So this has been adapted for a low vision workplace. Now pediatric low vision is very specialized and I don't expect that a beginning uh, practitioner will like to uh, undertake low vision practice to begin with, but nevertheless you should know something about how you to deal with a low vision child. Because low vision has got profound implications on uh, so many aspects of a child like motor development and scholastic performance. And after the age of three years, children do very well with the use of optical devices. But the trouble with children is to know what is their vision, to assess their vision, and to dispense low vision aids. So that's a big problem. So for that, you need to know what are the visual development milestones. And these are the visual development milestones in a child. From birth to first week, a child develops fixation and follows horizontally moving objects. From four to eight, eight weeks, he follows vertically moving objects. At five months of age, there is brink response which is present to visual threats, and so on and so forth. So if a child does not follow these visual development milestones, that gives you a clue that he has got visual impairment, perhaps profound visual loss. So that should alert you immediately. Now if the child is older, say about more than four months to between four months and three years of age, then you can use the Catford drum to define his visual acuity or record his visual acuity. You can also use VEP and preferential looking tests like uh, vanishing optotypes or Taylor acuity cards or the LIA paddles as you can see in this picture. And if it's a verbal child more than three years old, you can use some of these tests and the LIA symbol test is over here to measure his vision effectively. Knowing the functional vision of a child is also very, very important. Now there's a difference between visual function, which is color vision, visual acuity, uh, contrast sensitivity, to functional vision, which is how the child or a person puts his visual function to use. So the purpose of assessing functional vision is to know if vision is present in a child or not. If it is present, then what level, level of vision is present? And the third thing to know is, what is he putting it to use? So for that, we assess fixation in a child, eye movements, and what does he use his vision for? Educational tasks or independent mobility or social contact, and so on and so forth. After you have assessed that, then you put that child into an instructional program, which is run in three levels. The first level is vision stimulation, which is to make the child recognize what is dark, what is light, what is the meaning of light, what is the source of light, what is the shape of light, and then take him to visual efficiency training and utilization of vision. Special training procedures are there. We don't do them in our hospital, but when such a child with profound visual loss presents to our hospital, I usually refer them to other places, I'll tell you where. And these are just few pictures to show you that here somebody is training a child to appreciate what is light. And this is to show the child the shape of light, the source of light, and the direction of light. This is a vision box which is used to train children in appreciating light and taking them into those three levels of visual training. And this is where I normally refer patients to, the Blind People's Association in Ahmedabad and the National Institute for Visually Handicapped at Dehradun. So we are all clinicians, clinicians and we are very keen about surgery and operating and learning about new things. So what is new in the field of low vision? Quickly, I'll run through a few slides to tell you that a contact lens has been developed. It's a scleral contact lens developed by the military in the United States. And this gives you 2.8x of magnification. There's a central hole over here through which normal vision is seen. And these are diffraction rings all around. So, and it has to be used with a Polaroid glass. So when there's no Polaroid glass, then light enters to the center hole in the contact lens and one has got normal vision. But the minute you wear Polaroid glasses, it switches, it blocks the central rays and turns on the Polaroid light which goes into this diffraction area and by multiple internal refle reflections, the image magnifies and falls on the retina 
and that's the reason why a patient gets magnification with these contact lenses. But it has only been put to military use and it's not available commercially. Now this is ORCAM developed by uh, an Israeli company and you only need to point your finger and the camera will read what is given over there, magnify it and also read it out aloud to you. So this is available both for distance and near viewing. And this is an implantable miniature telescope which gives a magnification of 2.2x, this is 2.7x. And it has been around for actually 20, 25 years now. It is not new. And it was F FDA approved nine years ago. So this is how it works. You implant it in the eye and it gives you a magnified image on the retina. Very useful for people who got very poor vision due to AMD. It can be used in one eye only because that is the eye which will have the lens, the imp impl IMT, implantable telescope and produce a magnified uh, image. And the other eye will be used for peripheral viewing so that the patient can walk around in this natural environment. So one eye for magnification, one eye for peripheral viewing. Now this is a Lipschitz mirror implant which gives you 2.5x of illumination. And this is a much smaller implant and easily implantable than the IMT, which you saw in the earlier image. And this is the only area which magnifies. And it works on the Cassegrain dual mirror system of magnification. And there's a central hole, which is 1.4 millimeter in diameter over here. And this is actually the dual mirror system which magnifies. And this area has got plano optics. So this is the area which uses, uh, which is used for peripheral viewing. So the advantage of this lens is that you can implant it in a smaller incision and you can implant bilaterally in contrast to the IMT which can only be implanted unilaterally. Peripheral vision is not uh, lost. And so these are the advantages. This is Ori lens, which is a secondary Lipschitz implant. And this is the new one, which appeared in the market only two years ago. It's a foldable lens uh, developed by Shariat, and it's known as the SML, and it is only for near vision. So there's a central optical zone, which has got a plus 10 addition, and one can use it for near viewing. So when a person has this lens in the eye and looks for near, there's this triad of uh, <coughs> things which happen, which is convergence, meiosis. So when the pupil becomes myotic, it cuts off the peripheral rays and the light goes to the central area and that gives a magnified view of whatever the person is reading. And when he looks at the distance, the pupil enlarges and peripheral vision becomes normal once again. Now bionic eye is also very much in the market now. Uh, from science fiction, it has become fact now. And this is the commercially available epidural implant. Uh, it's called the Argus 2, and it gives you 60 pixels of resolution. And it takes about two to three seconds to recognize an object with this implant. There's a video camera mounted on a spectacle frame, which transmits images electronically and wirelessly to this contraption, which is surgically put around the globe at the equator. And this epiretinal array of electrodes is implanted inside the eye epiretinally. And uh, these are, are some reported results with the Argus 2 implant. Patients have been able to read nine millimeter high letters at 30 centimeters distance. And some of these patients could also read unrehearsed words. So it's a pretty impressive, but the downside is it won't give you a clear picture. You'll only see phosphenes, which are dots of light. Now they're working to improve the resolution of the Argus implant and work on Argus 3 is in progress where they will implant 1,000 electrodes epiretinally. This is the array, and the idea is to give the patient facial recognition at the least. So this is still work in, is in progress, and sometime in the future, we might see this improved implant. Now in recent years, researchers have also grown uh, human retina in vitreo, okay? So they have produced a 3D optical cup with all the layers of the retina including a photoreceptor layer with intact outer segments which were sensitive to light. So, and they have used human-induced pluripotent stem cells for their research work. Now, certain scientists in recent years, this is from 2018, they have used gene therapy, and they have succeeded in growing rod cells in the human retina. No, not in human retina, sorry, in mammalian retina. So human trial, trials are now going to take place. So this is another important thing which has come up in recent years, which is double gene transfer therapy. So that non-neural cells 
can be transformed into retinal photoreceptors. So we are not here yet to become total cyborgs, but we are going to get there pretty soon. Thank you very much for your attention. And that brings us to the